Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us by your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna Hosanna in the the highest. Again, good morning and welcome. We are delighted to have you with us here this morning at St. John's. Uh, Today is Palm Sunday, which marks the beginning of Holy Week, Uh, this final week of Lent commemorates uh, the events of Jesus's last week before his death and resurrection. The chief festivals of Holy Week are Palm Sunday, which we celebrate today, Maundy Thursday, and Good Friday, and of course Easter Sunday. We will be uh, coming to you online with all of these services. We will have our Maundy Thursday service Uh, up on uh, the the internet at 7 p.m. on this coming Thursday, and then the Good Friday service will be available at noon, and obviously any time after that for those services as well, and then uh, a full opportunity for you to worship with us on Easter Sunday uh, morning. Uh, We also would like to welcome this morning our bishop, uh, the Right Reverend Mark Lawrence, who will be delivering our message Uh, This Palm Sunday message is for the entire diocese and will be uh, available to lots and lots of our churches around the diocese who will be bringing it to them. So we'll be hearing the same message uh, from our bishop that our brothers and sisters around the diocese are hearing. So we're excited to have our bishop with us. Uh, I invite you to please continue to keep him and all of our diocese and leadership uh, in your prayers. And now let us continue with our worship. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, in your tender love for us, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and come to share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, beginning at the 13th verse. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and was esteemed, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning on this most unusual Palm Sunday. I wonder if you might join me in prayer wherever you are viewing this and join me in prayer to God. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the fire and burn. Convert and consecrate our lives for our great good and for the greater glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, this is all very awkward for me to stand here in this magnificent pulpit of St. Michael's Church and to gaze out upon these empty pews and preach a sermon to people whom I cannot see. But Soren Kierkegaard, that Danish philosopher of the 19th century, once said that most people have a misunderstanding of what a sermon is. They believe that it is a play written by God, performed by the preacher, and observed by the congregation. But he said, in reality, it is a play written by the preacher, performed by the congregation, and observed by God. Well, I don't usually agree with him on that, but I think in this case, it might well be a fact. I received an email a week ago that included a brief message, which I have been ruminating upon ever since I read it. It's by a, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Bishop James Wong, whom I first met some 10 years ago at a Global South gathering. He is the Anglican Archbishop of the Indian Ocean. I want to share what he wrote. He said, in just three short months, I just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I will shut down your stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I will shut down your civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down your theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse your stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me. I will make it where you can't go to church. Well, the good archbishop could have included other things in that list. He might have said, you want to worship health? I will shut down your gyms and shudder and confound your hospitals. You want to worship leisure and recreation? I will close the magic kingdom and gate your park. You want to travel and idolize remote places, I will dock your cruise lines and ground your planes. You want to worship nightlife, I will close your clubs, your bars, your restaurants, and will shutter your cities and your towns. Well, that has the ring of truth to it, mostly but let me suggest not entirely. It could be understood to mean that God sent this novel coronavirus as some kind of judgment on the world, as if it's like the plagues that he put upon Egypt 
to bring them to repentance or to drive his people out. But I'm not ready to say such a thing. Not yet, anyway. The psalmist in Psalm 74 talks about a great tragedy that has come upon Jerusalem, the raising of the temple to the ground. And he says to the people of Israel these poignant words. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet among us, and no one among us knows how long. How long, O Lord, is the foe to rule over us? Well, I'm not sure I'm willing to call this coronavirus something that God has sent to judge us. I might rather suggest it is, however, a judgment on the idols that so often we embrace. It reveals to us how frail life can be and how fragile and, veil of, and vain are, are at times our pursuits can be. It was John Calvin who said that the human heart is a factory for idols. We tend to always create idols. While it is fundamental to the Christian worldview that life and all life is meaningful and good and that evil distorts and disrupts the good and cries out to be set right, while it is fundamental to our Christian understanding of the world that evil is a parasitic, that it is disorder brought into the fundamental healthy good order of God's creation, that evil includes disruptive infectious diseases like the coronavirus and non-infectious diseases such as cancer, that it includes moral corruption such as human trafficking as well as that more normal kind of moral evil that you and I may partake of when we willfully choose to turn away from what God has declared to be good, and each of us has a partiality for one of the deadly sins, whether it is pride, envy, anger, sloth, or greed, gluttony, or lust. St. Paul spells out our problem in bold strokes and comprehensive arguments that this tendency that we have to create idols is something that we are all uh, uh, partaking in. From early days, Anglicans have often, especially during Lent, recited in worship the Ten Commandments, the, ver the first two of which I want to remind you of. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make of yourself any idol. When we give ourselves to idols, embracing God's good gifts separate from him, they invariably turn empty and let us down. Whether it be individuals, communities, or even nations, it takes us into the world well described in the book of Ecclesiastes, where all is vanity of vanities, cries the preacher. Vanity of vanities. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And then you will remember these memorable words. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. And perhaps you shall remember this one a time to embrace 
and a time to refrain from embracing. He goes on to say, what gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put in eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. He has put eternity in our hearts, this yearning for that which will last. But we have this desire to possess it, to control it, to hold on to it, to view it as mine, as ours. But in the end, of course, we leave it all behind. There is no eternity separate from God. No matter, how, no matter how lovely it is, it doesn't last. Some years ago, when my children were young, I was playing Monopoly with them on the kitchen table. There were at least three of them. There might have been four. I don't recall. But the first one to leave the game was our older daughter, uh, Adelia. You see, I had gotten all of the the green uh, cards and uh, the park place and boardwalk. All of the railroads had been dominating the game and putting up houses and hotels. And, and Adelia was getting close to bankruptcy, and so she just left the game, which left only Joseph and our daughter Chelsea and daughter Emily in the game. And Joseph soon began to weary and said, Dad, I think I'm going up to bed. Well, I said, darn, Joseph, I'll loan you some money if you need it to stay in the game. No, Dad, I'm kind of tired. So he left, and that left only Emily, kind-hearted Emily, staying there with me. And soon I all but bankrupted her, and she said, well, Dad, I think I'm going back to bed, up to bed. Oh, please, honey, stay for a while. No, I think I'm leaving. And there I was left with the kitchen table and the board and all my hotels and houses. And pretty soon, I put them all away. It all goes back in the box. Many live their lives without any reference to God. But whether they realize it or not, they are certainly not living without God. He is there providing much that they take for granted. If I might paraphrase Christopher Wright, God is the source of our lives and our health. It is God's creation that gives us the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. It is God who is the source of all love and joy in our relationships, all the exhilaration of our work, our ambitions, our sports, and our recreation. God is the source of all that, the beauty that we enjoy in music and art and in people's faces, in nature and in everything. The beauty of the sunset over the creeks and marshes of the low country the moonlight glistening through the pines at night, the glow of the gaslight on a misty Charleston street on a summer evening, the surprise and rush of a covey of quail flushed from the bush, the hug of a spouse, the greeting of a friend, the voice of a longtime companion that we hear on the telephone. God is the author and giver an energizer, the power behind all that makes life worth living and all that we have accomplished with all that God has given us. The question that this virus and this quarantine forces upon us is whether our normal life is that we enjoy these things with God or without Him. The whether we make of them things and gifts that He has given or idols that we give ourselves to with no thought of him. Every blessing, 
and every sorrow that comes our way is used by God to woo us and draw us to himself. The same God who creates the wonders of creation that dazzles us with beauty that comes to us in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ seeks to dazzle us with truth and love. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It is through this Jesus that we come into the eternal life of the Father, the giver of all that is true and gracious and lovely. And when loss and sorrow break our hearts, it is this Jesus who himself cried out at the death of his friend Lazarus and wept. It is this Jesus who on the cross experienced the depth of human dereliction in a comfortless world estranged by God by the sin he bore that we had done. It is he who invites and comes to us and says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He is the one who invites us to come. When life's pathway seems obscure and the, the way ahead seems most foggy, our belief and our faith and our trust has brought us under the power of Jesus as lordship. It means that the hands which hold the future are the same hands that healed the lepers, touched the lame, and made them walk, and allowed the nail prints to be driven into the wood. And when your goodness fails, and my goodness fails, as it always does, the forgiveness that flows from his cross washes over us, heals us, and ultimately shall transform us. And when life draws to a close, we close the eyes of a loved one at their bedside. He is the one who assures us, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Would I, if it were not so, would I tell you I go to prepare a place for you? And you know the place I'm going. You know the way. How can we know the way, said a disciple. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. When all other gods fail... When all our idols are shuttered, he will remain. He is, as the song says, the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, the light in the darkness. He is there when all other idols and hopes fail. May this day we put our trust in him and worship the only one worthy of our praise, our life, our soul, our heart. He is the one that shall give us eternal life. May God bless you. And please join me in a final prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Master Carpenter of Nazareth, who with wood and nails and hammer has fashioned for humankind our full salvation, work your tools within our hearts that we who come to you rough-hewn may by you be made into forms of greater beauty, greater hope, and greater promise for the sake of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we ask. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to offer prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. We humbly ask you mercifully to receive our prayers. Inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the way of righteousness, and so guide and direct their leaders, especially President Trump, Governor McMaster, and Mayor Wakila, that your people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. Grant that our leaders may impartially administer justice, uphold integrity and truth, restrain wickedness and vice, and protect true religion and virtue. And we commend to thy gracious care and keeping all those who serve the common good, especially our military, those in law enforcement, first responders, and all those who go into harm's way to protect us, to defend us, and to rescue us from danger. And we pray especially for Joel Billings, Hartwell Bryant, T.J. Carpenter, Jonathan Carroll, Alan Kopp, Matt Harvey, Bridge Jernigan, Daniel Lamb, Andrew McCarrier, Peter McCann, Paul Miller, Mike Shaw, John Taft, Stephen Turner, Ricky Tyner, and Peter Warren. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, and especially to your servants, Archbishop Foley Beach and Bishop Mark Lawrence, that by their life and teaching they may proclaim your true and life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation, that with reverent and obedient hearts we may hear and receive your holy word and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our prayer. We ask you in your goodness, O Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Peter Bike, Bailey Cannon, Kathleen Chapman, Samantha Cook, Katie Creighton, Lee Gary, Elizabeth Green, Harry Greenleaf, Mary Hepburn, Kim Hoffman, Mary Jackson, Bruce King, Jason Jones, the Reverend Anthony Cobidu, Trip Lizenby, Jim McMillan, Shirley Munn, Kara Stewart, Kara Murphy, Elena Stewart, Robin Stiff, Paul Wallace, Agnes Wilcox, Bishop Steve Wood, and Bob Youngblood. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. We remember before you all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and fear, especially Nita Skinner, mother of Roland Skinner, and James Hamshaw, father of the Reverend Jason Hamshaw, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we ask you to give us grace to follow the good examples of St. John and all your saints, that we may share with them in your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We also on this day, Lord God, ask your protection and prayers for all health care workers in our community, in our state, and in our country. We pray that you would protect them, that you would give them wisdom, and that you would give them courage as they face the peril of this coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins, to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon you and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you and And also also with with you. you. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. Good morning and welcome again. We are delighted to have you with us. As I said at the beginning of the service, we have a full contingent of Holy Week services and they will be available online for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Uh, We invite you, if you would like, to uh, give an Easter lily. We will be decorating the, the sanctuary for our Easter service as we always have. And Easter lilies can be given in uh, memorials uh, in Thanksgiving for those uh, around us. And so please contact the church office if you'd like to give an Easter lily. Also would like to commend to your prayers and and your energy if you have the time. uh, Our our Help for Kids ministry, which is a community-wide ministry to help feed uh, children, uh, elementary school children. That ministry continues even though the kids are not in school during this time and needs volunteers. If you are interested in helping with Help for Kids, please contact our parish office or you can contact uh, the Help for Kids ministry directly. They do need volunteers to stuff those bags, which the kids continue to need uh, during this time even when school is out. I would like to wish a happy birthday to those uh, celebrating birthdays this week, especially Lizzie Johnston, Tommy Rogers, Hallie Brown, Camille Cunningham, Dan Guyton, Morgan Matney, Logan Miller, Leland Carl, Billy Nasso, Lydia King Pippin, and Mike Hopewell. We'd also like to wish a happy anniversary this week to Susie and Chappie Jones, to Ann and Dan Irvin, and to Corey and Corey Prescott. Happy anniversary. Again, welcome. Delighted to have you all with us. Let us pray. I invite you to join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if you are able, I ask you to stand for the reading of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. And the soldiers stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, bystanders hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. And the rocks were split. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. 